Hey everybody, it's Tim. Just wanted to jump in right before we get started here on episode number 187, the live show. Just wanted to mention the audio quality is fine. It's okay, but it's not up to my very high standards because I forgot to bring my microphone with me. But I had a good backup and it works out and it's fine. It just won't sound as good as this. Also, I want you to check out the show notes for the video version of this if you would like to see all the flubs and the screw-ups, including the admission that A, I did not bring a microphone, and B, I started for the first few minutes talking with no audio. Super awesome. But if you'd rather just enjoy the sanitized edited version, just stick around right here. Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 187, and you can email the show at pedalshift at pedalshift.net, or call the voicemail hotline at 202-930-1109, and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and hello, everybody on YouTube. We are live, baby, live for episode number 187 of the Pedal Shift Project. I'm so excited. I am here very close to where I grew up in western New York. We're in the little hamlet of Webster. Actually, I think it's a village. I'm not even sure if we're in the village technically, but I'm not going to get technical. We're in Webster, New York right now. This is where my folks live. Right behind me, as I've told the folks in the chat room, behind my Buffalo Bills hat is Lake Ontario. So we're literally on the shores of Lake Ontario. And I'm up here visiting family uh, in between the two holidays. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to go back and revisit a little bit about my bicycle touring experience in this area as part of the show. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're also going to do an unveiling of my very first tour of 2019, excuse me, 2020. And we're also going to have an live Ask Me Anything segment for folks in the chat room. And for those of you who sent emails with questions ahead of time. So let's get cracking. All right, we're going to kick off the show here with a little bit of housekeeping as always. So uh, first of all, one thing I want to mention is that the very last episode of the year is going to be a, a 2019 in review. And I was thinking on the drive up here, it might also even have a few elements of my favorite shows of the 2010s, which basically means of the entire run of the show. So if you've got any thoughts on what you thought were best moments from 2019 or uh, best moments, in fact, in the whole run of the show, shoot me an email at pedalshift at pedalshift.net and we'll put that in the year end show. I really want to say thank you to everybody who was involved in the Thanksgiving show. I get such great feedback from it. From uh, all uh, from folks, I think that didn't even listen to the show uh, prior to this. I, it was really fun and really great. So thank you for all the folks who participated in it. I think that's going to become an annual thing where I put that out there. I I just I just really enjoyed doing it. Uh, a lot of fun. One little piece of news that I shared, I think, last episode is that my presentation before the National Bike Summit's Active Transportation Leadership Retreat that's a mouthful it, that was accepted, and I just I had a phone call yesterday as I sit here and record about how that's all going to go down. Now, that's going to be in the middle of March. And uh, if you're not familiar with the National Bike Summit, it is the biggest uh, summit of uh, gathering, basically, of bicycle advocates in the entire U.S. And it's every year in D.C. And I've always intended to go to it because I uh, kind of my my day job, if you will, is as an attorney that works with a lot of advocates uh, that are nonprofits and do a variety of different things. Uh, but I've never gone to this. And I thought, huh, uh, I, I should probably pitch an idea. And it got accepted. So I'm going to be teaching a really, uh, a, a really fun topic for me, at least, on the rules regarding lobbying activity and how to stay legal uh, as a bicycle advocate for all of the uh, bicycle advocates in the country. They all get together as a kind of a pre-show for the Bike Summit. So I'm really excited. I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be in mid-March. The reason why I bring it up here is, A, if any of you are bicycle advocates and are going to be at that Hi, come come say hi to me because I would really like to meet you. I'm looking forward to it. But also, I do know that I've got some other folks that are friends of the show who are going to be in town for the summit. So I'm thinking that we might try to do a meetup here in D.C., either the weekend before or one of the first couple of days of the uh, National Bike Summit. So stay tuned for that. Um, I'll be talking about that in future episodes. But 
I'm really excited about it. This is the first time that uh, Pedal Shift is getting kind of a really big national-ish stage in some uh, some kind of way, shape, or form. And I think that's kind of cool. Looking forward to doing that um, for the folks who are out there trying to do things to make it safer and better and easier and more awesome to be riding a bicycle in the U.S. So if you're going to be at it, I would love to meet you. Say, Be sure to say hi. Next up on the show is a segment about bicycle touring Western New York. I thought I would spend a few minutes here on the live show just because I'm here and uh, talk a little bit about the Erie Canal as a, uh, a bicycle touring destination. Now, if you're not familiar with it, the Erie Canal was built way back in the early 1800s and it absolutely transformed where I'm sitting right now. It became a major economic hub because what did it do? It connected New York City and the ports of New York City with essentially the Midwest by connecting Albany all the way west to Buffalo. And all of the towns and cities in between became major economic powerhouses uh, as a result of it. Now, uh, things changed over time, and maybe <laughs> I wouldn't call Rochester, New York, exactly the hub of everything now, but um, it certainly created a lot of things that have a great big legacy. The biggest legacy from a bicycle touring perspective of the Erie Canal is the towpath itself. So you've heard me talk about the C&O a lot on the show. The Erie Canal is was set up in a very similar way where there's a towpath along and barges were pulled by donkeys or horses or things like that uh, in order to get uh, goods and services from, or well, goods really, from point A to point B. And over the course of time, railroads really kind of outpaced it and then trucks and other things as well. And what was left was frankly kind of a decaying system. But over time... Folks who were very, had a good, a lot of foresight realized that there was a lot of value in what that trail was from a historic perspective and what it could be as a recreational and actually fact, a, a, a functional, uh, uh, commuting route for some folks along that trail because it's, of course, a traffic free area. So I grew up within a stone's throw of the towpath, um, in, in a town called Fairport, which is a little bit further south from here. And I remember when I was a kid and I would go on that, I would like look in one direction and go, if I kept going till the end of this path, I'd be in Buffalo. And then I would turn around and say, if I go all the way to that side, then it's all the way to Albany. Now, just between you and me, the towpath doesn't really work that way. It used to be a contiguous thing. And now, well, it's broken up a little bit. But the best part about it is New York State has done a really good job in rehabilitating it and elevating it into creating a oh part of what's going to be a fantastic bicycling system for bike tourists. And I'm really looking forward to getting involved in it a little bit more uh, in future years because I think it's really fantastic. I will tell you that if you want to learn more about it beyond what I'm going to yak about here on the show, go back and listen to either Tour Journals Volume 3, yes, Volume 3, because this goes all the way back to 2015, or listen to Pedal Shift Projects number 24, or excuse me, 024. Remember, I use the trailing zeros there. 024 or 026. Those are uh, the two episodes where I talk about this. If you want to see New York State, if all you think about of New York State is New York City, then you're really missing out. New York is a really diverse, interesting, varied, beautiful place from all of its different regions. And if you want to see it from the very far west to the eastern part, then do this trip. It's a multi-day trip. It's a great tour. It's a mix of trail and roads, but the route is fantastic, and I really, really enjoyed doing it. There's tons of small term let me try that again. There's tons of small towns with a lot of charm, including you get to go through my my hometown of Fairport, New York, which is this wonderful little town, a uh, little village that you go through. And there's good pizza there and there's it's a good place to stop. And if you ever do go through and take the Erie Canal and want some tips on Fairport, I got you. I got your pizza place. It's TK's. You go to TK's. I'm just telling you. I think it's a fascinating bit of in infrastructure as well. Like all of these old school canals, they are a look back into history. And, you know, it's several hundred years ago, or it's 200 years ago, roughly. Um, but how much has changed since then? But really, in a sense, when you think about what difference in technology there was back then, how amazing it was that they were able to make this waterway that actually traversed 
you know, areas where things went up and down, you know, the, the, the terrain was not perfectly flat and they dug a waterway through that and made it work with locks and other things like that. I think it's really cool. It's kind of interesting for me at least. And the history of course is amazing because as I mentioned before, all of this area, the economic engine of the country was really ruled by the fact that the Erie Canal existed and so much built up around here as a result of it. And you can learn a whole lot about New York State and really about the history of the 1800s. Hello. I forgot there might be phone calls, but here they are. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I think it's a pretty fantastic. But you're here to hear about the bicycling. From a biking perspective, the biking quality is pretty top notch. The trails are really in excellent condition and they hold up pretty well to poor weather. I've ridden it in all sorts of conditions, trust me. And it's, it really ends up working out well. Though even the worst parts are still pretty great. I'd say that they compare favorably to the gap, uh, the great Allegheny Passage in, in Pennsylvania. Camping is more expensive than it is in other areas and for other trails. There's not as many free options, but what's actually kind of cool is every single lock you can actually camp at. And generally you have to ask for permission ahead of time, but it's freely given and it's fantastic to, and it's really cool to see uh, different boats go through there in the, the currently functioning areas of the canal. You're going to be going by historic areas of the canal that are no longer watered, but for the areas of the canal that are currently watered and uh, working, there are boats that go through all the time, and it's really cool to go through that. Um, wild camping availability uh, was a bit overstated, uh, in my opinion, at the time. I'd be interested in going back and looking at it again from the, my perspective now, where I'm more comfortable in wild camping, my best guess is that there's probably plenty of availability. So if you're trying to do this on the lower cost side, it's certainly doable. There's tons of towns though. So if you are not a camper, you will be able to stay in, you, you will have no problem staying overnight in uh, any hotels or B&Bs. They're all through the area. There's very little super rural areas that you go through um, where you don't have services for a while. You'll have a town every few miles or every five to 10 miles at worst. Um, I've, I had great encounters when I've ridden on it. Of course, like I said, I grew up on it. So I think it's pretty good. I really enjoy it. Um, prime time to go. I'd say summer is probably a good time. But, you know, upstate New York, western New York can be a little bit muggy during that time of, uh, of year. Ideal time maybe around September uh, for warm days and cooler nights or October if you really want the foliage. And around here, the foliage is fantastic in the fall. So September, October, you really can't go wrong. Um, I've got a whole bunch of really cool uh, Erie Canal cycling resources from friend of the show and Pedal Shift Society member Paul Mulvey. I've got a link in the show notes to that. You can go check out, I think, the show notes to 026. So that's pedalshift.net slash 026 or the show notes for this show, pedalshift.net slash uh, 187. Um, so that's it. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to coming back here again to do some riding and um, – I've also learned that New York State is doing much, much more with its bicycling network, and there's going to be a much more uh, connectivity between different parts of the state, and in, that includes all the way down to New York City. So it's going to be quite possible to do a ride from Buffalo on the west, go all the way along the Erie Canal, and then go south along the Hudson all the way to New York City. It's there now, but from what I'm understanding, it's going to get better and better and better. There's also going to be routes north into the Adirondacks and beyond that. So I'm really excited about coming up here and doing a trip potentially next year. We'll see, have to see how it goes. But, um, you know, you can do little pieces of it or you can do the whole state. There's a lot there. And I'm really excited to be doing more cycling here in New York State. Next up on the show, we are going to be unveiling my very first tour for 2020. And Mookie, of course, is barking in the background. This is a live show, so it's all good. <laughs> all right. Maybe it's because he's barking because he's excited about this tour as I am. Um, tour Journals Volume 17, yes, we're up to 17, is going to be called The Kessel Run. Some of you may be like, whoa. Some of you may be like, what the heck is a Kessel Run? Okay. Last year, you may recall, I was down and I did a tour across the great state of Florida. I went from Tampa all the way across through Orlando to Cocoa Beach, and I did the whole cross Florida trip. 
I enjoy the heck out of that. And I think that going down to Florida for a winter bike tour seems to be a really, really good idea. So I decided, uh, I would say a few months ago that I was going to do something down in Florida. And I thought about, okay, well, maybe I would do a different type of trip. Maybe I would do the Keys, things along those lines. Well, if you know anything about the Florida Keys, you've got to be on top of that like immediately. You've got to be on top of that a year in advance if you want to reserve camping. I also, I understand that trying to get away with wild camping down there during the winter season, it's, it's a little tricky and it's very heavily policed and it's probably not recommended. So I didn't want to stress about that. So then all of the Star Wars stuff started happening this year. Of course, we got the new movie coming out. And if you recall, I think I might have talked about this on the podcast, but in the meetup, the Orlando meetup last year, one of the guys who was there was talking about, uh, he, I can't remember specifically if he had friends who were doing art design, but somebody was working on Galaxy's Edge, which is the new Star Wars land down in Disney Studios at uh, Walt Disney World. So I thought for a second, there are a lot of worse ways to uh, center. Normally what I do is I, I see th- cool things that are centered because I've got a bicycle tour. This time I thought what I would do is I would go down and do a cool event and do a bicycle tour around it. That's why this one is called the Kessel Run, because I am going to go down to Orlando. I am going to spend a day at... Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. I'm going to enjoy the heck out of that. I'm going to fly the Millennium Falcon and probably do it in tears uh, as I I think about, I was five years old when the first movie came out. I mean, this has been a big deal for me for a very long time. I'm a big Star Wars nerd and I happily embrace that. But what I would really like to do is to combine that with a bicycle tour. So I'm going to do that. The first thing that I did was I researched a little bit, maybe six months ago, about is there, can one bike to or from Walt Disney World property? The answer is, it's not a good idea. It's kind of the most unsafe roads I've ever seen in the United States of America. It is literally not built for anything other than four-wheeled uh, 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 vehicles and perhaps maybe a motorcycle if you're like lucky. So I quickly abandoned the idea of doing anything around bicycling to uh, Disney itself. I also looked into the camping, and camping fills up really, really quickly. It's not unlike everything else in Florida during the winter. It's hard to get camping unless you book it maybe up to a year in advance. I, I think that that's basically it. Walt Disney World has campgrounds. They're kind of expensive, blah, blah, blah. Maybe in the future, I would consider doing something like that. So then I backtracked to what was my setup for last year, which is basically think about it from the perspective of a Brompton trip where I'm going to be staying in hotels and Airbnbs. And that's basically where we're at. So here are the details. I'm going to be flying down at the end of January. I'm going to enjoy a day at Galaxy's Edge. I'm going to fly the Millennium Falcon. I'm going to probably be all teary and weird. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Um, then from that point on, I am going to finish the rest of my trip by taking the Brompton and cycling to Tampa from the Orlando area over two days. Now, the mileage on this is not going to be nearly as big of a deal as last year. In fact, there are going to be relatively short days, but I'm trying out a slightly different route this time that I think might be more interesting than last time. Uh, so that's kind of from a cycling perspective, the most interesting element about this. It, it From the bike touring aspect, it's a bit of a repeat of the challenges, but because I know what's coming, I think I'll be able to relax a little bit more into it. I'm going to be flying down and bringing the Brompton in the overhead. Uh, I'm going to be flying Southwest Airlines down. Um, for those of you who are Brompton people, I, I think that I've got come to reluctant agreement that Southwest is probably the best airline for flying with your Brompton because the of the universality of the overhead bin. Uh, their planes are all the same, and all of those bins can hold a Brompton. And uh, so that's why I decided to fly them. Also, flying from D.C. to Florida during that time of year can be really inexpensive. I think that I was about 100 bucks each way. So that's pretty fantastic in terms of a cost uh, set up for things. From there, let's see, I just wanted to check my notes here. Um, I said all of this. I, I think it's shorter than I'd like it to be, but I'm hoping that 
because I'm not doing a longer tour in the winter that I'll be able to trade that for a longer tour in the spring. So stay tuned on that. I actually have one that I have in mind that um, I'm hoping to be actually a week long that I'm really, really excited about. But in any, in any event, um, by the way, uh, if you were like, what the heck's a Kessel run? <laughs> If you're not a Star Wars person, um, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a thing with, that's part of the legend of Han Solo. And it's, it's, it basically was him taking his ship, the Millennium Falcon and doing an impossible trip in a really, uh, quick, quick way. And his line is, uh, what? You've never heard of the Millennium Falcon? It's a ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. I think it's awesome, but you know, whatever. Go see Solo. That, you'll learn all about it. So the challenges on this, A, it's a new route. Um, but I think it's a new route that I think I'm going to enjoy a little bit more. It takes a little bit more of a northerly tack uh, because of where I'm going to be starting. The other big challenge that I think I've minimized until, well, really just about now is that it's a west to east ride. Now, remember last year, if you were with the show, I did Tampa to Cocoa Beach. So I went west to east with the prevailing winds. It's entirely possible I may have a nasty headwinds the entire time. Also, last year, I had amazing weather. I had no no rain at all, no problems at all. You just never know. Now, normally Florida in January, uh, it's pretty decent weather, but it could, you can get a cold snap that you, it may not be super ideal conditions. I will say it will definitely be better than the snow and the, the cold that I'll be leaving behind. So it will certainly be better, but uh, who knows what the weather will be like? Um, it's not necessarily going to be some beautiful 65 to 70 degree day, although that would be pretty awesome if it were. Um, there was one other challenge that I had in there. Oh yeah. Little clown bike with limited shoulders. <laughs> I love the Brompton. I love touring on it. And, uh, it, it's, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Bromptons, they're, uh, British made bikes. They have 16 inch wheels and they fold up to a size where you can literally put it up in the overhead bin of a plane. So amazing portability. I, I love being able to leverage that and be able to do some cool tours. And I've done that on a few different occasions. Um, and I think that the, these winter trips are really perfectly made for that. I'll probably be talking a little bit more about modifications that I'm going to be doing to the extent I'm going to be doing them on how I carry gear. Um, there are a couple of things that I have to deal with. Frankly, one of the things that I am going to have to do is I'm going to have to trust in the fact that the Brompton is going to be kept in a stored baggage area. When I am at Disney, uh, I'm going to be shifting hotels on the, the night, one of the nights. And so I'm going to be dropping it off with basically the, the bell service and saying, when my room is ready, you can bring it in. Please don't break my bike. <laughs> so, uh, we're, we're, that's going to be something that I'm going to be really, I was, I'm going to be excited to be going off into the parks and doing the Star Wars parts, but I'll have to be honest. I'm going to be thinking about the bike the whole time. <laughs> so we'll see how that all goes. I, I'm fascinated by how unbike friendly Disney World is. It's just, it's not part of the mindset, even in the slightest. It was only until really recently that they allowed dogs and other pets on property and only in limited ways. So it's really just funny to see how the world is, has moved on in some ways, you know, like there's tons of pet friendly hotels and they finally caught up to that. And, you know, bicycling places and having bike racks and bike storage, that's pretty typical for all sorts of things, but it's just not part of the mindset of a, a vacation resort like Walt Disney World. It'd be interesting when I do go to Anaheim someday, um, that's Disneyland is literally integrated into Anaheim. I'll be very curious to see if there's more of a bike set up there. I should actually look into that. Mental note, mental note for, for, for the future. Um, as I mentioned, no, I will not be bicycling on Disney property. There is a trail in the campground area, but to get there, I'd have to get the, you know, I'd have to basically get bussed over to that area using Disney transportation. And then it's just like this kind of manicured little trail that goes nowhere. I've actually biked it before. I rented bikes there. 20 years ago or something like that. And it's beautiful and it was nice. I saw Nancy Kerrigan there. That might be a name that, that many of you don't even know about. The ice skater who got hit on the knee. Yeah, her. She was getting, she was, it was, she was doing shoots for a Disney shoot. I'm biking by and she's on a horse and I'm like, that's Nancy Kerrigan. That's a story that I did not, <laughs> did not think about telling. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I am not going to be trying to ride on the roads there. Uh, my, 
understanding is that they are technically private roads. Um, and I've read about some of the local Orlando area, uh, bicycle tour, not bicycle touring groups, but the, the bicycle clubs that I've talked about, hey, can one bike there on those roads? They are set up like highways. They're very fast and people are not looking out for bikes in any way, shape or form. They're looking out for Mickey and um, I don't want to become, you know, roadkill as a result of that. So no, I will not be riding on any of those roads. What I'm going to be using is probably rideshare, Lyft or Uber or something like that, that will be dropping me off um, from the Disneyland or excuse me, Disney World area out to the first closest, safest point to begin cycling. Uh, and I've already sort of mapped that out and I've got that all figured out. So more details on that when I do a preview show, which will probably be coming uh, middle of January because this is all happening at the end of January into early February. I'm super, super stoked about it. I don't know if I have possibly put that out there. From a bike touring perspective, this feels like a little bit more like a repeat, uh, but I think that combining it all with the other fun stuff that's going on, yeah, I think it's really great. And, you know, um, as I mentioned before at the top, very often I will do fun stuff that's the, that I'm doing because I'm doing a bike tour. Now I'm doing a fun thing and I'm adding a bike tour on top of it. That's sort of the idea of the Kessel Run. Tour Journals Volume 17 for Pedal Shift. And I'm really excited to share that with you all in January. Uh, well, actually, it'll probably be shared with you in February. Next up on the show is the Ask Me Anything segment. This is an opportunity to ask me anything you would like about bicycle touring. And occasionally people will ask me other funny questions like, do I prefer the Stones or the Beatles? I think, I think I lean the Stones. I think barely by, by hair. I like them both. I, why are you making me choose between the two? Anyways, questions about bicycle touring and whatnot. I've got uh, folks in the chat room who are going to ha have a question or two. I've also got some emails from folks uh, all around the country and around the world. And so I'm going to start with one of those, actually, because Quinn asked me this question, I believe, two days after the September live show. So Quinn goes first. Quinn got in line early. Uh, Quinn asks, have you come across a good or recommend a water filter system for making river or lake water potable? Something suitable for hiking would be great. Um, so Quinn, uh, my uh, device, my thing of choice here is the Sawyer Mini. There are a ton of different uh uh, potable water making devices out there that mimic what the Sawyer did. I think Sawyer as a brand did it first. I think that it works really well. Um, I've been very happy with it. Um, there are other versions of the Sawyer. There are straws. I think even Amazon is making their own kind of internally branded version of this. So what I would say is I don't think you necessarily have to buy the brand of Sawyer, but I will say that Sawyer is a good tested brand. It's been used a lot, but it's amazing how many of these devices, how much it's gotten really, really cheap over time. Um, I've been very intrigued with the uh, ultraviolet, the UV treatment ones, um, but I, I do have to say that I like the idea of a physical filtration um, that goes in there as well. That would be my recommended one. That's the one that I use. Now, I will say as a caveat here, I don't do a lot of touring or backpacking anymore that requires filtering of my water. So frankly, I don't use it very often. But uh, when I have used it, I've been very happy with the Sawyer Mini. So that's the one that I would end up saying. Um, other folks, um, uh, check out Ultralight Backpackers. Um, on YouTube and elsewhere, those folks are right on top of things in terms of what's the good brand and what's the good technology. Um, I'd be really curious if uh, things like Amazon's brand, which is probably essentially made in the same facility as some of these other more known brands, they just happen to, you know, private label it. I'd be very curious what those are like and if those are worthwhile. I think that they're coming down in price dramatically. These things used to be a hundred dollars or more. And now I think I'm seeing prices in like the high $20 range, which is kind of crazy. Now, if they're not effective, then it doesn't matter if they're $20, but if they're effective in, in $25, $29, that's amazing. A great peace of mind to take on you, take with you on a, a backcountry tour. So I would say go for it. Uh, Sawyer Mini is my preferred one. I, you know, I have one. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, but, uh, do some researching with some of the backpacking folks as well. But, um, thank you for that question. 
Let's see. Dan. Nope, Dan, that was about the Brompton. I've got uh, Eric. Eric Lee Vincent uh, from the chat room here. Have you considered part of the Lewis and Clark route in the Pacific Northwest? I see lots of touring in the summer along U.S. Highway 12, and it seems kind of sketch up the, to the pass of Montana. Eric, let me tell you something. That was my original 2014 route. If uh, folks who have been with the show from way back when, uh, back to, let's see, early, the double O episodes, the, the first few episodes of the show was uh, following along my route down the Pacific coast. And the reason why I did that was because originally I was going to be doing the Lewis and Clark route and I was going to be doing that sketchy ass pass, <laughs> which is apparently it's, it's bikeable. It's doable. It's a, it's a uh, American Cy- uh, cycling association, ACA route. Um, people do it. It's just, you know, it, it can be a bit sketchy in parts because of the, the logging trucks in particular on highway 12, uh, Lolo pass, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't do it because Washington state, it was 112 degrees every day for a full week that I'd be cycling kind of in that area. And I just can't do exposed heat like that. I just wasn't interested in cycling in that. I am desperate to do that route at some point. And in fact, um, what, in fact, I think I've got a question in here, uh, later about a cross country route. One of the things that I want to do to complete a cross country route is to do that part of the route, uh, just because I'd like to end in Portland, Oregon as, as the sort of the end of my segmented cross country route that I've been building through the years. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely want to do it. I think I want to pick and choose the right time to do it. I think the teeth of summer is not the right time to do it, but. Lolo Pass is socked in uh, with snow and bad weather for large parts of the year. So the window is pretty narrow. And one of these days, i got to figure out when I'm going to do it. Uh, but it's definitely going to happen. I, I, I am super intrigued with it. I, I love the idea of the Lewis and Clark route. Um, I think it goes through some amazing parts of the country. And I really want to take advantage of that sometime. So great question. I'm really super into that. Uh, let's see. Dan asks, if you ever want to do a gravel tour out west, check out the Idaho Hot Springs Loop. Funny you should mention that. Uh, my boy, MJ, uh, Mysterious James, uh, he has talked about doing that for a very long time. And uh, he just recently did, I believe this year, a route that was a completion of one that he had to abandon at one point because of injuries. But he's always talked about bringing this new bike on the Idaho hot springs loop. And I really, really think it looks fantastic. It looks, it's, it's nice. It looks discreet. I think it was like five to seven days of memory serves. Maybe it, maybe it's a little more than that, but boy, it looks really cool. I'm, I'm super into looking into that. Um, I, that may actually go to another question about, uh, do, do, am I looking at a third bike kind of a thing? Because a third bike would be super helpful for something like that. Dan also, oh, Amisha follows up on the water filter thing. Physical filter and iodine or chlorine sterilization, I would prefer. I, I think you can't go wrong with any of that. There's, you go with the, the system that works for you and also sort of the peace of mind that works for you. For some people, just a pure filter isn't going to give you the peace of mind. You're going to want some other chemical thing, a chlorine, an iodine, or something like that. There's all sorts of different ways to do it. The UV thing is, is kind of interesting. Um, iodine, I can't handle the flavor. It just drives me crazy. Uh, I've, I've done the chlorine uh, trick before. I, I can't remember what the, the ratio is. It's a few drops per gallon. Um, then let it sit for a while. That, that actually ends up working really well. I say go with the method that works for you. But whatever you do, please, please, please make sure you're staring sterilizing your water in the back country. You, you will ruin a trip real quick if you catch something. And some of those parasites are just nasty, man. Uh, Dan follows up. Dan Green, uh, what's your favorite non-essential items for a bike tour? Non-essential. Define non-essential. Uh, that that Because some things may be non-essential for others that I would consider essential. I would say the thing that I like having the most is probably... Even though I don't always bring it, I would say be, being able to make good coffee. So, um, if I'm, if I'm bringing along my good coffee kit, my, my uh, portable grinder and all of that, um, I would say, I don't know if people would consider their phones to be non-essential anymore, but for me, my iPhone is, uh, 
close to essential. I, I, I don't know if I could qualify that as a non-essential thing. I guess you don't need it for a bicycle tour per se. You could go with a paper map and just not have a communication device with you. And it, so if you consider that a non-essential item, I love it because it's my entertainment device. It's my communication device. It's how I can do work. Uh, it, it's a really, really powerful tool to have with you, um, when you're on bike tour. So yeah, I, I really would say the iPhone is probably up there with that. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that I really enjoy having, you know, oh, actually I'll tell you what it is because Annalisa Vandenberg actually asked uh, this uh, similar version of this question before, like, what's your luxury item? She asked. And for me, it is, um, a, I, I guess I'll call it a back jack. And what it is, is that it's a foldable, rollable, uh, a chair. It, now it sits directly on the ground. They're originally meant to be used with thermarest to make, to convert your thermarest into a seat back chair. And I don't use it with anything in it, uh, cause it works just fine without it, but it rolls up really, really small. It's very light. And what I love about it is I can sit up in the tent with it and have you know, support, back support. And it is fantastic. It's the one thing that I don't like about going into a tent is I don't sit very well kind of cross-legged style. Um, I, my, my, I, I'm too tight in the hips for that. And I, I, it's just not comfortable for me. So, you know, to be able to stretch out, have my, my legs stretch, uh, out, I can have, if it's cold, have my sleeping bag over me, but to be able to sit back, watch a video on my phone, maybe d- tap out a few emails, do some social media work, man, that's aces. I just love that. So I think maybe that would be the right answer to the question. All right, let's see. Let's go on to some folks who emailed questions. If you were able to get a new bike, ah, this one. If you were able to get a new bike, what would you get? Would it be an addition to or replacing either that you have? So first, uh, the second, uh, let me answer the second part. First, I don't think I would replace either of the two bikes because I love both of them. I think that the Novara Safari has been a fantastic touring bike and it would make me sad to uh, give that up. Um, it's 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 sticking with me. The Brompton, you're going to have to pull that out of my cold dead hands. Okay, so it would have to be a third bike. I'm intrigued with a gravel bike or a bike that has um, substantially wider tires for maybe some winter riding. Not necessarily a fat bike, although it would be nice if the bike could handle fat bike with tires. So I'm looking at a bike like the Surly ECR. That's the bike that Mysterious James just got that uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago or something in that realm uh, that can give me some better off-road capabilities. I love the Safari. I love it as a trail bike, but it's not a gravel bike, not the way that I've got it configured. And I don't think it can handle tires or wheels that would do what I would want it to do. So for a third bike, I think I'd be looking at something like a Surly ECR. Um, so thank you for that question. Let's see. What do we got here? Steve M. Gap and CNO question. You know I love these. Let's see. Must do bikey post-ride things in DC or pre-ride things to do in Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, not a sports guy. Also, any other tips on how to minimize costs would be great. Camping is not an option. Okay. All right, let's say, so it sounds like that you're going to start in Pittsburgh and roll to D.C. Pittsburgh has a wonderful area of town. I'm going to have to get back on, on, on this. It's a market area that I just recently went to with friends who are Pittsburgh people. Um, if anybody in the chat box, there's a bunch of you in there right now uh, that know this area. It's a, it's a market area. It's away from downtown a little bit, but still close by, still bikeable. There's a, there's a weekend market there. I wish I could remember the name of it, uh, but look this one up there. It, there's tons of great, there's a t- Italian uh, uh, food. There's um, a great place. There was this, uh, uh, it was a liquor store basically, but the most, Education I've ever gotten on gin in my life happened there. A uh, very cool part. Pittsburgh has got just a lot of great character. It's a really cool place to go to. Um, uh, that would be the place. The north side also, the North Shore area, is also really, really great. Um, the trail happens to run along there as well. Um, there is a good... Um, hotel there it's called is it north side oh wow you're catching me at a bad time because I, I don't remember the name of this but i'm gonna have to get back to you on this and actually maybe i'll put throw this in the show notes a better answer for you on all of that um but there's a good 
bike friendly um, hostel that I've stayed at and it was quite good. And I talked about it in a prior episode of it as well. And if somebody says it, I'll, I'll remember the name of that off the top of my head, but the North shore is really good uh, for, if you're just sort of in the area, there was a, a great bunch of places. Of, uh, if, you're, if you're into beer at all, there's a bunch of good bars along there that have great selections as well. Really, really fantastic. Pittsburgh's great. It's a great place to start or end a tour. I really like it. On the DC side of things, post ride, Man, it, it, a lot depends. There's so much to do in D.C. Uh, I would say that you're most likely uh, to find some fun things to do. Well, I live in D.C. The one thing that you th- that's funny about D.C. is like when you visit D.C., all you do is go to the mall and you go to the museums and you go to the monuments and stuff like that. I live within a stone's throw of all of that. And when you live in D.C., you never go to these things. And they're awesome. They're super cool. And biking around that area is amazing. So I would say, you know, find a good, safe place for your bike. Um, I would not recommend, don't, don't leave in either of the two cities. Don't leave your bike unattended with your gear on it. Um, there are good safe places, um, where you could leave stuff on your bike and probably be gone for a little while and to be fine. However, you know, you, you just don't want to take that kind of a risk. Um, so I would say, um, the, I believe that the hostel, the international hostel in DC is in the downtown part of DC. Bike tourists from all over swear up and down that it's a great place to go. So I would recommend that if you're trying to cut costs. They've got a place that's inside where you can keep your bike locked up where it's safe. So I would say go there, get your bike all set up, stay there or wherever you end up staying. Have a good place to, to have your bike set up. Use Capital Bike Share if, you, if you're intent on biking around town, which is, by the way, the best way to get around D.C. If you're going to be using Metro, the our subway system, that works too. But biking is such a great way to get to know DC. I would say stick, go with the, go with the classics, go with your, your, your tours of, uh, of, uh, the monuments, uh, and, and the museums and stuff like that. You will run out of time before you run out of things to do. That's really good stuff. I like hanging up in the neighborhoods and DuPont Circle and Shaw, Adams Morgan, stuff like that for, uh, places where DC folks tend to live and work and, and, and hang out. So that, th- those would be my recommendations for you. Uh, back in the chat room, wide tires are great, says Byron in Australia. I recently purchased a 650B with 47 millimeter tires. They're smooth. They smooth out the bumps of the gravel. Yeah, that's a nice wide tire. I like that. I like what you're doing there, Byron. Uh, Dan, Surly ECR is a great bike. I have a few friends that own one. I almost bought one too, but went with the Krampus. That was another one I've been thinking about as well, uh, which has the same plus size tires. I, I am definitely looking into that as well. Um, Steve M, thank you. Definitely interested in the off the beaten path points of interest in both locations. Yeah, you know, if you can find a Pittsburgh person, they love Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh people love Pittsburgh and they will, they will show you the city like you wouldn't believe. DC man, I would say whatever interests you, we've got. Um, if you're interested in history, we got a touch of that. If you're interested in, um, the beer scene or, you know, the, the craft liquor scene, we've got that. And we're a great cocktail town, by the way. So if you're into that, do it up. It'll be the end of your tour. You can do it. So yeah, go with that. Um, let's see. Uh, Misha's, oh, Misha's on me to get up to the Maritimes. When it's, uh, when it is hot, July or August, stay coastal, come to the Maritimes. That's New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, beautiful areas, uh, or Maine, U.S. side. Um, Nova Scotia is rarely hotter than 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I, you're, you're going to get me up there. I love the Maritimes. I years ago went to PEI, uh, right after the bridge got put in. And that was like super controversial for the uh, Prince Edward Island people, but it was great because it's a lot easier to get there. What a beautiful place. The, the, the sand, the rock up there, if you've never been is uh red, just beautiful red, almost like the desert Southwest of the U S so gorgeous, really beautiful. You're going to get me up there eventually. I love me some Canada, as you all know. All right, let's see. I'm going to mark all of my, uh, let's see. There we go. Next one up in the chat box, or excuse me, this was an email. Uh, what do you think about e-bikes? Um, I, I, I like e-bikes. I'm, someone's alarm is going off. All right. Well, it's something that my dad has. That's cool. Um, so <laughs> what do I think about e-bikes? I think they're fantastic. Uh, I am a big fan of accessibility 
for bicycle touring or for cycling in general. And I think that e-bikes really bring that along. So I am not opposed. I'll say that one more time. I am absolutely not opposed to e-bikes in bicycle touring. I'm wondering though, if the technology is quite there yet for a true good rock and roll tour with an e-bike. I know that I've read a few folks on the, in the Facebook forums have been able to get away with it. I'm wondering if the range needs to be a little bit more for someone like me who wants to do maybe 50 or 60 days, pardon me, 50 or 60 miles loaded. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I think that the battery technology is going to catch up with that. I, I'm a real big fan. I think e-bikes are pretty amazing. And the fact that they're able to give people longer ranges um, when they may not have the uh, physical capability to do them, uh, I think that's great. I think that's really good. I think there's a lot of people who have a bad attitude towards them that I see. And they're like, oh, they're going too fast or it's not safe. And I'm just like, Ride your ride, man. I like e-bikes. Anything that gets you on two wheels, I'm cool with. Um, but be nice, be a good citizen, yada, yada, yada. Uh, next question is, let's see, cross country trip in the cards? Question mark. Yeah, sort of. Um, I would say this. I, I, I turn a round number age in 2021 and I think I'd like to have completed, um, I'd either like to do by that year, a full cross country trip may not be in the cards just from a timing perspective, or I would at least like to get my final segments together of all of the rides across the country that I've sort of pieced together. So as of right now, I've got from DC all the way to Cincinnati, uh, which I did last spring. I also have the Katy Trail done. So my next thing that would connect those two things together would be to complete between Cincinnati and go through either Indianapolis or south of Indianapolis and then hook up with St. Louis. If I do that, then I've got basically from DC all the way to Kansas City. So I'm about a third of the way across or maybe a touch more than that. Um, so that's one piece that I want to do. I figure that's about a week right there. I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to make it to do all those things. Cause I think what it would require is for every single one of my bike tours between now and then to, uh, be that, but I don't know. I, I, there, there's a piece of me that's sort of like by that round number birthday, it'd be kind of cool if I had a, a, a cross country, the long way route. Of course I've done a cross country north to south before in my life. So maybe, maybe I'll just have to feel okay with that and just keep riding my ride and piecing together the tours that I want with the time that I've got. Uh, I don't know. I would love to, con- I would love to have a contiguous one. Um, I just got to have the time to do that. And at least in the near term, I don't think that's in the cards, but I'm super into it. I'm really excited about doing it at some point, even if it's in segments and that would make me perfectly happy too. Uh, Dan, let's, oh, uh, Misha says PI is too touristy, but they have 700 miles of continuous trails and you can leave your car off Island for free. Ooh. Good tip. Pro tip. Pro Canadian tip. Dan Green, been wanting to do the Pacific Coast route. What section or sections are your favorite? Ooh, going to make me choose, are you? Okay. Um, it is impossible for me to say no to the Oregon coast. It is amazing. The uh, facilities by the Oregon State Parks are a plus if you're camping. If not, there's town, uh, all of the coastal towns have all the, the uh, facilities that you want and need. So Oregon coast, A plus. If you've got more time, my favorite part of the route is from effectively uh, straight out from Portland, Oregon to let's, we'll either call it Seaside or Tillamook all the way down to San Francisco. That is a freaking plus. Um, you get so much good stuff, but Another part of the ride that I think is really excellent is Big Sur. So that's south of San Francisco. Um, that is an amazing ride. So you could do a segment of the ride from San Francisco to San Luis Obispo. Excellent. Parts of the ride that I think are worth doing. If you're a completist, if you want to do the whole thing, do the whole thing. But if you're, you're like, eh, I just want to do the good stuff. Washington state is, is nice, but not nearly as good as Oregon or California. Uh, it just, it just isn't. There's great parts of it, but it's just, it, the route isn't as good. I love it. I enjoy it. You get to go through Aberdeen. I get to go hang out where Kurt Cobain used to hang out, you know, cool stuff like that, like little things that are fun. You could do the, the, um, the wide route around and be on the coastal side of Olympic National Park. That's kind of cool, but I'd say it's skippable if you're not wanting to do everything. Another part that I'd say is very skippable is everything from Santa Barbara south to the Mexican border. 
I loved biking through LA. I thought that was super cool. It was one of my favorite parts of the trip, believe it or not, just because it was such a pleasant surprise. But it's not good for camping. Um, it's busy. It's urban. And if you're not into urban riding, I'm into it, but you might not be. Uh, I think that it can be a little bit, it's not, it can, it can be less fun. If you're camping, you can't camp in much of these places. The campsites that exist have deteriorated from what I've heard a lot. There's, there's a lot of, um, all night shenanigans going on. Um, and they've actually closed a lot of them, um, uh, because they're getting pressure from, uh, you know, and no judgment here, but a lot of the homeless population has kind of moved in there and whatnot. So, I mean, that's a, Bigger ticket question and issue having to do with homelessness and and uh, how we can what we can do to solve that and, and remedy that. But uh, in any event, that's that, that there's pressure on all of that. So Southern California, south of Santa Barbara, I would say if you're camping, you could skip it. If you're going to be able to stay in Airbnbs and hotels and stuff like that, go for it. I loved it. It was really really great and really cool. Um, I would say go for it. But uh, I think I, I hit it at a really good time. I had a great experience all the way through. I didn't have any bad experiences in any of these places. I really enjoyed it. So I, I would say um, go with what you're hearing the most. Um, but I would say uh, Oregon Coast, Portland to San Francisco in particular, if you want to go a little bit wider. And then, of course, from San Francisco to San Luis Obispo or down all the way to Santa Barbara. But definitely hit Big Sur. Big Sur is fantastic. It's really, really good. Um, let's see. Last but not least, I got, we'll, we'll make this the last one since we're a little over time here. Episode 200 plans. Yes, we are a mere 13 episodes away from 200. So the question is, do I have 200 plans? No, I don't actually, not specifically. I know that the ETA for episode 200 is early April. Uh, and I, I actually had to look that up when I got this question. So I'm open to ideas. So feel free to shoot them to me at pedal shift to pedal shift or not. I liked doing the meetup in Portland for episode 100. So I'd be cool to do something like that again. So, uh, but, uh, by the way, uh, sprocket number 500 is coming up. Yes. Five zero zero. Um, uh, just thought I'd mention that there may be, there may be a guest, a guest person in on that. I'm just saying that just be, be mindful of all of that. Um, all right, folks. Um, I, that is, that's it for the, uh, ask me anything. Thank you for everybody in the chat room. Thank you for everybody who sent in questions. I really appreciate it. And, um, thanks again for joining another episode of Pedal Ship Live. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community, expanding into live shows and covering new tours like this year's DC to Cincinnati bike tour. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot and annual options if you're not into the small monthly thing. Check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Dittis, Thomas Skadow, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgatis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Stuart Buckin, Mr. T, Roxy Arning, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince Greco, Paul Culbertson, Scott Culbertson, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Drew Porter, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robert, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Hankel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Aviles Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Dan Gephardt, Jody Zoranen, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtol, Reinhardt Biggle, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, William Goffman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Latois Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Tom Bilch, Ronald Paroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafner, Misha LeBlanc, Ari Messenger, David Grotke, Todd Grosbeck, Wally Estrella, Sue Reinhardt, John Lecco, and Stephen Granada. And thanks also to all past and anonymous stoners for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album, 
track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.